What is good YouTube, it is your boy Flex And put your muscles up Cause we back with another video So in today's video man I bring to you how I broke the world's record for longest kill So you know the live documentary So I know you guys are gonna enjoy this one baby So let's cut out all the chit chat man Let's get right into the video Put your headphones on, turn your volume up Get that full experience Let's get into the video I looked so much, up let's go. and I could see two guys With a, um, a PKM uh, Belt fed um, Russian machine gun and they were hammering down on the lads and my rifle only shoots 1500 meters so I had to I call it lob in I lobbed the bullet in my guy said Kobe with the bullets that's crazy can you remember the first mission well, that dude is huge bro yeah I can it was in Iraq we are in the Maysan Desert and the Maysan Desert is a vast, vast place and it's desolate. We were getting scouted by um, a motorbike and every time we saw this motorbike, loads of mortars were coming. The artillery and the mortars were getting pretty damn close. And then I got the green light to um, take the target out. Um, I saw he was on a motorbike the hardest bit about the shot was heat shimmer because if you ever see somebody walking in the desert they look slightly, they look really tall and as they come towards you they shrink to their normal size so he was 675 yards away I shot, um, missed my first shot, second shot I got him and then I had to go up to the body to to see if I had um, if he, he, he was you know, dead. And I remember walking up to the body, um, the motorbike throttle was stuck in the sand and the, the bike was revving and an AK strapped to it. And uh, the guy was on the floor and he he passed away. Um, he, I'd shot him here. Uh, yeah, weird, weird. Bro, that gotta be so hard. It has to be so hard. You know what I mean? Even though, you, you know what I'm saying, you signed up for it, it's part of the job. Still having to having to relive those moments must be the toughest thing, bro. Must be the toughest thing. And I commend this guy for real. Weird feeling. I commend Weird anybody. Feeling. You feel like you're in this. trouble. You feel I've just killed someone. I feel in trouble, and that feeling never left you. You know, when I got back to the the vehicles, um, we bagged and tagged the guy. He had loads of int on him. He had been following us for days and days. Um, but people are thanking you, going, oh, yeah, good shot, tapping your shoulders, good shot, good, you know, good mission there, Craig, well done. But you just killed someone, you know, and it took easy a week to realise that no one's going to tap on my shoulder and go, can we have a quick word? You've done something wrong, you know. Um, yeah, well, that, it, it, strange feeling, strange feeling. You said snipers work in, in pairs. Yes, they do, yeah. Can you spin that one? You have one and a number two. Now, number two is, is usually the best sniper because he'll work out all your calculations, he'll work out all the wind, everything you need to know for your scope. And basically, then he will tell you to put it in, and all you've got to do is pull the trigger. The number one is probably the best shooter. We've got to understand then that sniping is not all about shooting and killing. The first job of a sniper is to gather lifetime information of the battlefield. So I'd look for my scope, I'd see a bloke come out of his compound with his with a, a lady and um, I would make up a story, say, oh, there's Limpy John with his wife. And it keeps your mind occupied and goes, oh, let's see what Beryl's doing. And then you go over to Beryl, oh, let's see what Bob's doing. Oh yeah, there's Bob doing the same old thing, and you get. To and you know what's funny? I do the same thing, bro. When I'm out, people watching, I kind of make up stories and scenarios and conversations between people that I'm kind of watching. No weirdness, you know what I'm saying? But you know, that's funny that he does that because I do kind of do the same thing. Know their routine. It's like I said, you get to know lifetime information of the battlefield. It's quite hard, really, because when you do get to take the target out, you're killing Bob. You know, and you've made a name up for him for the last four days, you know, but that's the sort of thing you need to mentally switch off. So when you're, yeah, that's crazy. Like, was it four days at least? They're not in that spot? There for four days to start off with, put it that way. 
um, and I was in the same position. I used to cat nap through the day, roughly about 15 minutes through the day. You end up pissing. Um, I dug a like a trough between my legs, and uh, I had sores down here. Then inside my legs, obviously your your piss is quite acidic as well, you know. But it gets to the point where you do need a poo, and um, you, you can't really move. You can't take your eye off the glass. You got to keep on target. You work as a pair, so you just roll over, and he helps you basically. He um, will put a little Tupperware tub under your bum. Off he goes. He'll wipe you, and then you. Cry. How many of y'all got best friends Battery like that, bro? Low. I guarantee you, even my best friend Charging wouldn't do that battery. for me. Sorry, headphones is dying. But I guarantee you, even my even my my best friends wouldn't even do something like that for me, bro. That's that's camaraderie for real, bro. Holy smokes! I come with your mission. That's how that, that's how important snipering is. This was early on in my last tour. We had to give Overwatch for the Afghan army to move into this village. Now the Afghan army were a mixture of British soldiers helping and train. So this was just a mission to go into this village to, to move insurgents out. My officer was there and he could see that in the village itself was just full of insurgents, absolutely full of them. And he warned the, the, the patrol was walking into a kill zone. Now a kill zone is where it's easy to kill you. Basically, it's a zone of land where it's open, you've got nothing to hide, or nowhere to hide, so I say, and then they, they, they can just mow you down, and that's the kill zone. And they moved into this kill zone, and they got opened up on. And I could see a flicker in the distance, and I couldn't work out what it was. Anyway, I got my scope on to the uh, the flicker, and it was a an insurgent with a radio. He, and the flicker was the antenna. As I was looking at the lads in the vehicle, see if they were getting out, because no shots were getting fired, I could see sp uh, random splashes happening, and I was wondering what they were. And I was looking everywhere. Everywhere that I engaged a target, I was looking. Couldn't find anything. The only place I didn't look is where I saw the guy with the radio. And I looked up and I could see two guys with a, um, a PKM uh, belt-fed um, Russian machine gun. And they were hammering down on the lads. And it was a long way. It was 2,475 metres away, which is just over a mile and a half. And my rifle only shoots 1,500 metres. So I had to, I call it lob in. I lobbed the bullet in. Uh, it took me nine shots to get there because I was bracketing. And what bracketing is, is that you fire the first shot, see where it lands, add a bit more on, add a bit more on, add a bit more on until you hit it. And I managed to hit the compound wall. So I fired and I could see it just hit next to him. So I fired again. As I fired again, he stood up and I, I hit him here. He fell backwards. And then the second guy stood up and I fired a third shot. And as I fired my third shot, I moved my rifle across and I fired a fourth shot. <clears throat> so now I've got two bullets in the air at the same time. Third one missed, fourth one hit him and it hit him in the side. It was 2,475 meters. Bro, that's, that's probably one of the hardest things I've ever heard in my life, bro. What? My guy doubles out. He said one of these is going to hit. One of them is going to hit. Bro, that's... That's badass for you, bro. That's... <laughs> now, I didn't know I broke the world record. I didn't know at all. That's I didn't great. know until my medals parade. Do you, do you feel pride of that? Uh, no. Not at all. Doing my job, trying to save 12 guys. That was it. And this, this goes through some of the other missions you were on. Are there any that stand out in your head as dangerous? One mission, we were in Basra Palace and we got go to this place called the Pijok. And the Pijok basically is just run by 15 people. That's it. And it's next to a prison. And it used to get smashed every single night from 11 o'clock at night till 5 in the morning. It is the gates of hell. 
the gates of hell and they're trying to release all these insurgents all these other hierarchy um, Taliban from this prison and it was our job to not let them do that and it sort of gave the locals a bit of um, security as well knowing that you know that soldiers were there protecting the prison as well so there was no chance of escape there was no chance it would get liberated and overrun we were on the roof on this occasion you know we was using the machine guns on both sides because as soon as they hear a sniper shot they all run off so I told the machine guns to start firing uh, the gym piece to start firing and it masks our shots and they came from north, they came from the south, they came from the east, they came from the west, they came from everywhere. And um, we got absolutely, I'm going to say it, we got absolutely f***ing smashed. We thought we were going to get overrun. So I phoned Tanya. I get a bit upset, you know, sorry. Um, I phoned her and she answered. And um, and I said to her, I love you, you know. And then she goes, I know. She, she goes, what's all that noise? And I said, that's nothing, that's nothing. I said, I'll phone you in the morning. I promise you I'll phone you in the mm. morning. Just want to hear her voice, you know. Just want to hear her voice. And we went back on the roof and, yeah, we were in the fight. Did you call your, your wife? Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, and I didn't really tell her what was going on. We just had a little chat. I said I just had a little little, um, little wobble, what's to call it? A little wobble, just wanted to hear your voice, that was all. You know, it's tough out here. And she goes, yeah, I'm always here for you. Like, like she is now, you know. It was like a wall got shattered. And when that wall of ice got shattered, everything that I've experienced in my tours uh, through Bosnia, Kosovo, um, Iraq, Afghan, I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. My wife noticed it first. She noticed that there was something wrong due to my isolation, my snappiness, my to depression really and suicidal thoughts I'm not going to lie I will cry later because a lot of memories come up you know a lot of thoughts I don't I don't disguise it you know I'm a big advocate for PTSD but I find I'm ashamed to have PTSD and I, I'm the first one to admit it it ruins your sex life it ruins your home life ruins your friends because no one wants to be around you because you're just miserable. You don't want to go out because you get so f***ing angry so quick. The army noticed it and I got called into the MO's office which is the medical officer's office and then you sit there and they look at your medical records and they go, okay, stamp it, you're gone. From doing 20 odd years took half an hour for me to get kicked out. My um, yeah, I, I'll say it. My, my um, wife, we went to America, um, stayed there for a bit, and um, my wife went back to England to see her mum, and I uh, yeah, I nearly shot myself. I took all the rounds out of the gun when I was practicing where to do it, where I would do it. And um, I put the bullet in, cocked it, put it in my mouth, and Betsy was sat on the back of the sofa. She's a um, little Yorkshire Terrier. I used to run 10 miles a day, like five miles out, five miles back, and she used to run with me. She's um, 15 now. Wow. And her head tilted. And tilted the other way. And I just stared at her. Yeah, I sold it. Sold it. 
got rid of it. Saved my life. Wow. I wouldn't be here now. I was sat talking to you guys or on this planet if it wasn't for my wife and my dog. No fucking way. I would have checked out. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. We then deployed to Kosovo. Uh... I've said this before, guys. Uh... <clears throat> Hopefully I'm not too quiet, man. I've been messing with my audio settings all day, man. But, but uh, I've said this before, guys. Don't don't play with your mental health, man. No no matter what your circumstances is, whether you, you've been to deploy and you got PTSD, whether you know, you've, you've uh, suffered assault and abuse growing up as a child, don't play with your mental health. Don't wait until the last minute before it's too late. You know what I mean? This I I commend anybody and I thank anybody who's who's been through this and and is still a, and is still a survivor. You know, because it's a daily battle, it's a daily struggle. Mental illness is it's no joke, guys. Man, this this one right here, yo, this one right here. This one almost pulled the heartstring, man. It almost pulled, you know me. I mean? It almost got me, guys. It almost got me, bro. Man, if you guys enjoyed this, if you guys enjoyed this, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Post in the comments down below, man. And, uh, you know, of course, hit that big red button, man. Bam. I love this video, man. Until next time, guys, put your muscles up. I'm out of here. Peace.